Welcome to round four of the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul. Darwin, Northern Territory, known for its balmy nights, outback adventures and this weekend is a motorsport mecca. The 2.87 kilometre Hidden Valley Racetrack plays host to not only the Australian Superbike Championship but the Repco Supercars Championship as well as drag racing. I'm Rihanna Crean and thanks for joining us alongside me, our series commentator Phil Harlem stepping in for Steve Martin this weekend. Thanks very much, Phil. How exciting is it to be here in Darwin this weekend? It's great. I love coming to Darwin. It is a fantastic track. The weather's always great and the racing will be absolutely sensational. It's a two plus four weekend for us here with ASBK. We've got the supercars and ASBK. You can really feel the vibe in the paddock. There is, and it's not just in the paddock as well. In the lead up to the event, there's been crowds everywhere. People are keen to meet the superbike riders, get their autographs, and there's going to be some great racing this weekend, which will surely keep the crowd entertained. Now, the last time the Australian Superbike Championship was here in Darwin, back in 2018, so much has changed since then. I don't think any rider is still on the same bike since that since that year. What do you think that things we're going to need to look out for? Well, it's obviously it's the first opportunity this year for the bikes to really open up in fifth and sixth gear with the long straight. Winton and Wakefield Park, very tight technical circuits. This weekend, a long straight. Those bikes are going to be going really fast at the end of the straight. Also, there's going to be some new bikes and also uh, some other things that might be new this weekend as well. Now, our last round, Wakefield Park, we sort of have to wind back the clock a little bit. I think eight or nine weeks since we were last racing in the Australian Superbike Championship. A vastly different racetrack, a vastly different climate that faced our riders. But it was the same two guys battling it up the front. Troy Herfos, Wayne Maxwell, they put on an absolute clinic. For me, it was race two. That it was an absolute highlight. What was stood out for you? Race two was obviously a fantastic race, but the moment at the end of the race when Wayne and Troy stopped and had that mutual moment of respect, that was the spirit of ASBK. Fierce rivals on track, but they have great respect for each other, and uh, I think that was probably my moment of the round. Well, let's take a look at the championship points as we head into round four here in Darwin, and it is the Boost Mobile K-Tech suspension bike of Wayne Maxwell sitting at the top of the championship table, 91 points. Troy Herfos sitting there chasing his tail on 81 points. Mark Jones on the Desmo Sport Ducati in 74 points on third. Crew Halliday on the Yamaha, 64 points. Glenn Allerton sitting nicely there in fifth on 64 points. Brian Starr, he's slowly climbing up the ranks on 54 points. Jed Metcher, Metcher Motorsports in seventh on 47 points. Arthur Sissy's doing a really good job there in eighth position. Ollie Bayless on 45 points in ninth. And rounding out the top 10, Matt Walters on 42 points. It is very tight at the top. Let's take a look at what we've got coming up on today's show. Kicking off all the action, we have qualifying session number two. Then we've got the Alpine Stars Superbikes race one, two and three. We have an extra race for your viewing pleasure this weekend. Let's get all the action kicking off right now and head up to your commentators, our series commentator, Phil Harlem and Chad Nalon. Not too far away here from going into this second session. We're actually green in the session already. And I wonder if we're going to see some games here. Because particularly for this guy, Troy Herfoss, he could really do with a nice slipstream down that front straight. The problem is his pit position is a little bit further up pit road. So he'd like to be closer to some of those Ducatis to tow into the back of them. Honda and Ducati MotoGP style with Mark Marquez and Jack Miller like we saw last time out in Catalonia. But they're not in the right spot to be able to do it. Yeah, I think we'll see some fun and games in this session just simply by the track position that the riders are trying to put themselves in. But the thing about Troy Herfoss is that this is the fastest Honda that he's ever had here at um, Darwin's Hidden Valley Circuit as well. It is considerably faster in a straight line than the old model Honda, which he had great success here on. So uh, it's only a couple of kilometres of top speed down too, and I think that uh, Troy Herfoss may have just been doing a little bit of foxing so far this weekend. He's certainly one to watch in this qualifying session. And he showed in that first session that he was able to uh, get the Penrite Honda right up there. And uh, yeah, he's certainly one to watch in this session as well. He really wants to take that point and the $500 from his team owner as well. How animated are these bikes and how awesome is it to watch these riders position themselves over the tank hanging the knees down, dropping elbows onto the racetrack. They manhandle these bikes and doing that over 16 laps today in over 30 degree heat with the humidity is going to be a very difficult task as and we can, go green. What you can also see too, Chad, is the amount of effort that the componentry on the bike has to deal with. All of the foot pegs, the, the gear shift, the brakes, the suspension, it's all working overtime in the heat and also the way that the guys are actually really pushing these bikes. 
So are we going to see the quickest ever lap? Curve cam, what a shot. By a motorcycle at Hidden Valley. It was set here two years ago by Troy Bayless himself, 105.60. That was really a qualifying session that set shockwaves around the world of superbike racing because all these guys around the world watching Troy Bayless at nearly 50 years of age at that point, I think he may have even turned 50 by then, turned that lap time, and that is just an incredible effort. Well, the thing was, though, too, that uh, that was what really signified that Troy Bayless was back, and he actually won a race that weekend as well. It was his first race win in ASBK for many, many years. He'd been trying, he'd been knocking on the door for quite a while, but uh, that weekend was actually really special here at uh, Darwin's Hidden Valley. I have fond memories of that whole weekend, the racing that we saw, and I'm um, expecting something very similar this weekend. There'll still be a Troy involved, it'll be Troy Herfoss, and uh, I think that Wayne Maxwell and uh, also this man here, Mike Jones, will also be involved in that battle. They've been the top three riders in the championship so far this season. There's not much separating them on the points in the ASBK championship as well. And we're just not quite to the halfway point of the season yet, so there's still plenty to play for. And uh, you can't win the championship this weekend, but a no score in one of the races could mean that you actually throw your chance to take the championship away. Plenty of riders happy to use Ollie Bayless as the tow truck, including Daniel Fowlson. Oh, this is going to be a little bit tight. Herfoss had that front tyre chattering all the way up towards Turn 6. Yeah, I think he was pretty desperate to try and get past Daniel there, so that make sure that when it come on, comes onto the straight, that he's in the best position to take advantage of all these slips. Now, before this qualifying session started, Troy Herfoss on Bike 17 said to me he wasn't going to try and orchestrate getting a tow, but if one was there to be taken, he'd happily take it. And he's positioned himself perfectly behind Oli Bayless to get a huge run down the front straight. It should have speeds at well over 300 kilometres per hour by the time he grabs that break down in towards turn one. Jones goes through, 106-1 from Mike Jones. Nice lap. You can see how far Oli Bayless's bike pulled out on Troy at the beginning of the, uh, the straight here. But look at the late braking. Arthur CC's down the inside of uh, Troy Herfoss and then runs a fraction wide. Daniel Felsen comes on through. I think the mind games have started already, Chad, because uh, yeah, Troy got the slipstream there but pulls out the lap straight away. So can Oli Bayless answer the time from his teammate Jones? Goes quicker again to the first sector. 21-0. Really fast through sector one to Mike Jones. Well, Wayne Maxwell hasn't actually put in a fast lap yet. He's just completing his out lap. So he'll be uh, ready to fire the Boost Mobile racing with KTEC machine around to try and take that pole position in just a moment. And Maxwell goes straight back to the 105.68. It's almost identical to where that lap time was earlier today. 105.68, so yeah, was within thousands of a second of his fastest lap in the earlier qualifying session. Jones now, 105.7, he's second into the 105s. And the Ducatis are finding more speed. So big improvement from that first qualifying session to the second one for the man with three MotoGP starts and one MotoGP point to his name. What was happening on the other side of the circuit for Daniel Falzon? A little bit of a wrestling match going on with the 25. He's still sitting in behind Oli Bayless there as we switch over now to Lachlan Epis and the brand new next gen Maxima BMW M1000 RR. The bike that revs to 15,500 RPM as he comes down the straight. Now you can see him selecting gears there, getting ready to uh, really wind this bike up into the top end as he comes down the end of the long 1.1 kilometre straight. Hard on the brakes. Ant West just moving out of the way there to allow him to go through. And this is the moment Maxwell does it. 105.5, quickest lap ever by a motorcycle around Hidden Valley Raceway. Smashing Troy Bayless record here from 2018. And that is going to take some beating. Mega lap, 105.50. And that is his fourth or fifth lap now, under 106. Maxwell is absolutely attacking this track. And that would have come up on his speed angle dash uh, lap timer as well, so he'll know exactly what lap time he's done. Doesn't look like he's pulled out of this lap as well. He's having another go. Well, he's pretty... Well, let's say he wasn't real deep there into that, uh, into that corner, but with Wayne Maxwell's very... Um, economical body movement style. You don't actually know sometimes when he's on a fast lap and when he's not. So Maxwell Jones, Falzon 106-0. That's an awesome lap to get onto the front row for now. Daniel Falzon, wow. Perfos with some work to do. Allerton fifth. Haven't seen the best of Oli Bayless. Didn't get a good lap in. So what's going on with the second generation star? He's down in ninth at the moment. And has potential to get inside those top three spots. He'll want to go sub-106 today given the fact that both of the Ducatis are already comfortably there. Well, Wayne Maxwell comes back into the pits with just under seven and a half minutes remaining in this session. 
There's Glenn Allison on board bike number 15, the Maxima M1000 RRBMW. Currently sitting in fifth place. That's where he spent most of the weekend, Chad, isn't it? Really fifth place or so for uh, Glenn Allison. 106.3 is his best lap time now. He's coming back into the pits. They'll put a new rear tyre in that machine. Just wondering if a lot of the teams are actually taking advantage of the brand new tyre that uh, Pirelli have homologated for this weekend. The new uh, Y2, was it Y0206? Some teams <laughs> have actually tried it and gone, no, I actually prefer the old tyre. There's Gary Crilly from Pirelli. Going around checking the tyre temperatures of uh, the machines that are using the Pirelli rubber. That was a mega lap. 105.50. So Wayne looking like he's uh, possibly going to have another go as well. They would have planned a tyre strategy based on the amount of tyres that are allocated for this weekend and the fact that they've got three races for tomorrow. So if there's another tyre there, they could very well throw it in and try and go faster again. Not only is that lap under the lap record here set by Troy Bayliss for a superbike, that's all very close to Scott McLaughlin's qualifying record here in supercars, which came here two years ago. That was a 105.4. There's a 105.5. He's three hundredths of a second away from McLaughlin's quickest ever lap around here in a supercar. Pretty sure that's what he's going to go for this, if there are, is another tyre available in the <laughs> allocation as Josh Waters on board the BC Performance Bike 21 comes back into the, uh, the pits. Josh Waters is currently sitting in 11th position. So that's the way the, uh, the grid is looking at the moment with Wayne Maxwell at the top, Mike Jones in second, Daniel Fowlson in third. So they will be the three riders on the front row of the grid. Three riders across each row of the grid here for the ASBK races at Darwin's Hidden Valley. Troy Herfos, Glenn Allerton and Arthur Cece's currently making up the second row of the grid. But there is five minutes to go and in this five minutes everything could change. I'm pretty sure that Troy Herfos is going to push extremely hard now to try and get up onto that front row of the grid. He realises how important it is here to get away with the Ducatis, especially on the long run down. And Phil, while Wayne Maxwell set that blistering lap time, Troy Herfos was standing in pit lane watching the time screen. He knows exactly what he needs to do. He's, you know what he's like when he's off the bike. He's incredibly focused. His face is incredibly intense. He just got back on the bike. He's back out on track now. Let's see what he can do. Mike yes, Jones. And, uh, everyone needs to keep their eye on Troy Herfos. Been saying that all weekend because uh, he is all pumped up. Here he goes for another run. As Jones just overcooked it down there at turn one. Grabbed a tear off going down the front straight and then grabbed a handful of brake. Just a few metres too late and as a result runs it wide and onto the grass. Four and a half minutes to go. Yet to see the best from Ollie Bayless. 44-0 to the second sector. This be good luck. Where does it put the 17-year-old? On that beautiful Ducati, the kid from the Gold Coast goes to the front row. 105.8, so he's got his first five of the weekend and goes right up towards Maxwell, Jones and Bayless. So like Josh Waters heading back out on the BC Performance Kawasaki ZX-10RR. The other thing that Wayne Maxwell uh, likes to uh, remind people of uh, too, Chad, is that uh, he is not a factory team. They are a 100% privateer team. The bikes are built uh, and prepared by Craig McMartin in his garage in Belrose in Sydney. Wayne Maxwell uh, works during the day, uh, has a normal job, trains and has a family to uh, provide for and look after as well. So, uh, yeah, all of those guys, even Greg and Julie from Races Edge Performance, they don't get paid to come to the race meetings. They're forking out money from their own pockets to, uh, to be here and race because they all love racing. That's the reason why they're here. So, Maxwell still at the top of the time sheet, but Brian Starr and Luke he's on a hot lap now on two on board bike number 67. And Herfoss about to fire his first shot, and he's going to have a little bit of a toe from Ollie Bayliss here as well. So Bayliss and also Herfoss about to improve on their times. Bayliss goes to second, Herfoss goes to third. So change in the front row. And that was a big last sector from Ollie Bayliss, 21-7, and he goes to with two hundredths of a second of pole. So Bayliss goes to second, Herfoss up the front row as well. And now Maxwell winds it up again. Quicker to the first sector, goes sub 21 seconds to the first sector. So the front three guys are all turning up some speeds. With two minutes 46 to go, this is heating up. Yeah, I think Maxwell's got the soft tyre in the back now and he's really pushing it. Look at the corner speed he actually carried through there. Look how he drifts it into that corner. Coming up towards the very technical end part of this lap. Jones goes to third, knocks Herfoss off the front row for now. So nice lap from Jones. It's an old Ducati front row, unless the Honda can fight back. But let's go back to the Boost Mobile K-Tech Ducati. 
And he's going to go quicker than a 105.5. That's the question. Can he go quicker than McLaughlin's supercar lap? Whoa, 105.1. That is crazy speed from Wayne Maxwell. That's a giant lap. Three tenths quicker than the field. And that is astronomically quicker than the lap record around here. And a big one. Down at turn six. Yep, that's Mike Jones, on, unfortunately, on board bike number 46. Down. That's his uh, final run. So he will start no better than third position on the grid. But the question is, with one minute 50 remaining, what can Troy Herfos do to try and get himself up onto the front row of the grid? He's currently sitting in position number four as we watch this incident now involving Mike Jones. Looks like he comes out there, gets a fraction wide, a little bit offline on the brakes, just loses the front end. Bounces straight back up onto his feet, which is great to see. Mike A-OK. -okay. He will be vulnerable for losing that spot on the front row if Troy Herfoss can get back out and do one more run. Wham! Down onto his left shoulder. It looked like he was just checking out his left hand on the way out. Thankfully, he's OK and should be ready to go for race one. Herfoss is back in the pits. I think that's the, uh, the run from the Penrite Honda done and dusted. I think Troy now realises that he's going to be starting from fourth position. There's no way he can get out and get around to uh, put in another lap with only one minute remaining in this session. Mike Jones uh, looking like he does have some sort of injury there to his left hand, taking his, uh, taking his KYT helmet off with just one hand. So what can Brian Starring do? He's one of the riders that's still out on track, currently sitting in seventh position. He needs to find a couple of tenths of a second to get himself up onto the second row of the grid. What's he able to do on this lap as he comes down now to the start-finish line? Starring goes across, stays in seventh position. But he will get one last opportunity, Chad. Wayne Maxwell, he'll take another opportunity if he can get it to try and even better that lap time. And it's the same as what we've seen at every other round so far this year. They're not just taking a tenth or two out of lap records, they're taking half a second or a second. That's what Wayne Maxwell's done. Well, he's about to back up that 105.1 that he's already set. It won't be quicker, or will it? Never know. The chequered flag comes out 105.55. So on par with what we saw from Mike Jones earlier. He's pumping out the 105s. Can he do it over the course of a race, though? That's the question. He's comfortably secured pole by three tenths. A dramatic second qualifying session. He beats the factory Ducatis in qualifying. He takes that all important pole position point as well. And this is going to be really exciting. And Herfoss did get that bike back out, but not enough time to get around and start a lap, which was curious. Yeah, we're taking advantage of the practice start because he's going to need a good start starting from the second row of the grid. Troy Herfoss is a pretty good starter though, so. Uh... Yeah, expect him to try and get away with the, uh, the top guys. Well, that was a really impressive qualifying run. Everybody found something towards the end. Five bikes going under the 106 marker. Three riders going under the existing qualifying lap record. Troy Herfoss nearly getting there as well. But an incredible lap from Wayne Maxwell. 105-1, he takes his second pole position of the year. And also, his second pole position here at Hidden Valley. Oli Bayless, a great ride to be on the front row. He had something for him for a while, but not quite for the rest of the session. Ducatis, one, two, three. The Kawasaki's not quite inside the top 10. So cool to see the range of bikes out there, but it's the Ducatis who are currently on top at the moment. What an incredible qualifying session here in Darwin, taking out the Elite Roads pole position was Boost Mobile with K-Tech Suspensions, Wayne Maxwell. Wayne, congratulations, a phenomenal lap, absolutely smashing the lap record. Yeah, super stoked, like to be able to do that lap time around here, the fastest ever lap, and um, yeah, to do it with my crew, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome, you know, it's been some trying times getting out of Victoria and getting up here, and uh, it's a great reward for everyone's effort. Heading into the week, this weekend, and even in that first qualifying session, did you anticipate, or did you know that you'd had that sort of pace in you? No, not really. I was definitely shocked. Like, yeah, I, I was surprised myself with how good a, the lap time was and how good the bike felt and how good I felt. So, um, yeah, we've done a lot of hard work and keen for this afternoon. Uh, I was standing in pit lane. The, not only superbike guys, you know, their, their mouths dropped, but supercars the drivers, their mouths dropped. Very impressive time. Yeah, very impressive. So super happy. And, um, yeah, obviously, I, you know, I'm eager to see what they can do in their lap time. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I can uh, get one up on the boys. Congratulations. Phenomenal effort. Thanks so much.
Battling the big teams in the Australian Superbike Championship are the privateers. They are made up of mums, dads, best friends, family friends, best mates. They may be small in numbers, but they are big in heart. It takes a huge amount of dedication and commitment for these privateer teams. Let's meet some of these teams that make up the backbone of this sport. I guess it's been a family thing for, for all of us for a very long time. Dad started racing and all his brothers and, and even my granddad. So um, it's always been a family sport for us. We all love to be here and that's why we all do it. It is a massive, massive effort from everyone, not just myself. But um, yeah, I honestly wouldn't be able to do it without them. So yeah, everyone, everyone's just as happy to be here as I am. We uh, drove here this weekend. We've had a bit of a holiday on the way up, which has been good. But it's always a challenge to get everything ready, get everything sorted. Um, make sure everything's prepared right after work as well. So it's a little bit of fun. It's a lot of fun with your mates, but um, yeah, still trying to get the, get the job done. We've had some good success here in Darwin in the, in the past, but we've just had a bit of bad luck the last couple of years. So hopefully we can try and turn it around and really put the right foot forward and, and get back to the front. We did it for so many years pre when I was riding in the factory. Uh, so we're, we're well versed in, we know what to do but it doesn't take away from how much effort that everyone has to put in. So it's, it's a real team event and all you have to do is look at the results from back in 2017. We did perform very well and there was a couple of other privateer teams as there is this year that are performing very well. Uh, I think particularly 2021, it's, it's going to be more difficult for us against the Ducatis and the Hondas. They, uh, I think, are a bit of cut above the rest, but I'm just going to do my best. I'm out here to beat the Yamahas. We don't have the resources that they do. They crash a bike they can get whatever we, that they want and I've only got the one bike so it makes it a bit harder. I have to try and stay on the bike so it's a bit of pressure but yeah I usually don't crash as much touch wood but yeah that's, it's, it's okay. I'd like to get a podium uh, in one round at least. It's been a few years since I've been on one. I'm a bit further back now because I crashed in the last round but I'd like to be first a Yamaha or privateer so. The big challenge obviously is budget, um, everyone struggles to sort of put the budget together being a pretty small sport and uh, in Australia and, and not a lot of people actually riding motorbikes in Australia as per like Asia and America and stuff like that where the manufacturers have, they make a lot more money so they put a lot more money back in. I came back from Europe about three, uh, four years ago I think it was now and I sort of gave, it just, it was a bit too hard you know, I couldn't find the budget. Um, to be really competitive you need the money and, and it, was, it was a bit tricky so to have CMEC on board and Yamaha supporting us, we've created a team that's all really fun to be in and, and we're also becoming competitive now. So there you have it, some of our privateers that make up the Australian Superbike Championship. It truly is a family affair. Don't forget to look out for them next time we're on track. Less strategy involved here today for My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul. This is round four of their championship. Lots of young stars like Ollie Bayless, son of three-time world Superbike champion Troy Bayless, who is here. No pit stops, no safety cars, just a flat-out blast for 16 laps here. And really looking forward to seeing how this is all going to unfold. Two riders so far this year have stood out above all. They certainly have, Chad, and that's Wayne Maxwell and Troy Herfoss. They've taken all of the wins between them. They've taken all of the pole positions between them. Wayne Maxwell's qualified on pole here. That's, that's his, his uh, 22nd pole position in ASBK, and he's 62nd front row start. There's the man they're all going to be chasing. Great to have Rihanna Crean down on the grid, enjoying the heat and sunshine, Rihanna. Yeah, thanks very much, Chad. It very, very much is warm down here on the grid. I just want to highlight position number three is vacant for this race. That should have been taken by Mike Jones, Desmo Sport Ducati. We saw him take that tumble in the last part of qualifying too. He actually has been taken off-site to Royal Darwin Hospital for further observations and some for some more tests for his injury. So that's a real shame that Mike will be missing this race. Marcus Kyoto also absent from this grid. He is also uh, suffering some injuries from that second qualifying session. So he is with the team at Race Safe. Let's have a chat to our man that is standing on pole position, Boost Mobile KTEC suspension, Wayne Maxwell. Blistering times in qualifying, a 105.1. Absolutely smashed everyone. But we want to know how fast is this bike going to go in this race? Uh, hopefully just fast enough to win, I hope. Um, yeah, look, we just got to play it smart. We have really good speed all weekend from uh, the session one and, um, yeah, we're just going to play it really smart and um, try to come away with maximum points and, uh, yeah, keep doing what we've been doing all year.
I feel like it's really early in the season, but I also feel like we need to talk about the championship because you and Troy, you're locked together, but you got one point on him. Yeah, yeah one more point, and I, I've lost to him one by one point before, so it's all important. And um, yeah, yeah, we're just working on session by session and uh, keeping it pretty simple, and uh, yeah, just enjoying it, as I said. I'm going to uh, quickly sneak over and have a chat to Ollie Bayless, Desmo Sport Ducati. First time he has been on the front row of the grid in a superbike here in Darwin. Congratulations, Ollie. A fantastic result for qualifying. Yeah, thanks, Rena. We're, we're really happy with where we're starting for, for the race one, two and three. Uh, we're in a good position, the best position we've been so far this year. So, you know, I don't really know what to expect from this race. I don't think a lot of people do, but... Um, We'll see what Wayne does, see what Herf does, and see if we can play with those guys. And soak up the atmosphere, because there's plenty of people just enjoying Superbikes this weekend. Yeah, that's it. Darwin always produces a good crowd, so it's uh, good to see everyone here again despite COVID. All the best. Good luck. Cheers. Thank you. Ollie's best qualifying performance coming into the weekend was seventh. He has far surpassed that, putting it on the front row. But sadly, he'll be missing his teammate at the Desmo Sport team who went down in qualifying. It was a nasty one for Mike Jones. Here it is again if you missed qualifying action earlier today, up towards turn six. And Phil, initially, it didn't look to be too major. He had only a little glance down at his left hand, but clearly has hurt it. Yeah, it's uh, obviously done some damage. You can see there that the actual bike landed on his hand and probably got his hand jammed into the tarmac against the, uh, the handlebar as well. So... Uh, it's something that a lot of motorcyclists have uh, got to come to terms with. I know when I look at my fingers, they're not in the best of shape, but you know, I'm sure Mike Jones will be back hopefully tomorrow to take part in the two races because he can't afford to drop too many points. He actually is in this championship battle with Wayne Maxwell and Troy Herfoss. And on the Penrite Honda, Troy Herfoss just locking in the helmet. Troy, position four. I know you would have been wanting to be on that front row of the grid. You've got the ice packs just getting as much cooling as possible. Uh, what can we expect in this race? Yeah, it was a real disappointment to miss, pole, miss uh, the front row. Um, I'm obviously not happy with our one lap speed, but that's just the way it is. I, I think I'd done my best lap. Like uh, last time I went to bed, I thought if I can get into that mid fives, I'd be really happy. It just wasn't good enough. So, um, but I think we're strong. We don't know. We, no one's tested here. Um, I know I'm fit enough, and, um, and that's going to count for something. We know how fit you are. Good luck, Troy. Thank you. Does a lot of work on two wheels, with or without a motor, and that's where a lot of that fitness comes from. I think it's actually going to count for more than something in this race because most of the guys have been talking chat about how hard it is to hold onto a superbike. The amount of physical exertion required to get a bike around here in the 105s, after six laps, it is going to be starting to suck every piece of energy out of these riders' bodies. And there is no one out there on this grid that is fitter than Troy Herfoss at the moment. Plus, when, once he gets the red mist happening, um, he's going to be very hard to beat. And the discussion I have with his team manager, Dion Coote, they think they're in a pretty good place. They know what their race pace is. And he's got Paul Free, the genius, uh, working on the bike as well. And uh, some of the data that he just showed me is absolutely unbelievable. And you can't actually comprehend the information they're able to get out of this bike. And this is how they're going to be lining up today behind two-time champ Wayne Maxwell, Boost Mobile, K-Tech Ducati. That's a privateer entry. Unfortunately, Mike Jones will not be taking his spot next to his young teammate, Ollie Bayless. But yes, that is the famous last name. Ollie Bayless, son of three-time world champion. We've got a range of bikes to watch out for. Ducatis, Yamahas, Kawasaki's, BMW with that brand new M1000RR. Watch out for the one and only Honda. That'll be in the hands of Troy Herfoss and Suzuki down towards the back of the grid with bike number triple three. And it's so great to see this championship running back with the Supercars Championship. It's been eight years. Tasmania 2013, only two riders in the field today were there eight years ago to go running around at Simmons Plains on that day. Hopefully we get to do a lot more of this. The fans love it. The Supercars teams have been enjoying it as well. Red flag and we are ready. Watch the lights. Who will win the race down towards turn one? Do the Ducatis have the power? The Superbikes are back. Two plus four. Sissies as well as quick. Yeah, Troy Herfoss also got a great start. He'll be second as they come down in towards turn one. But Brian Starring. Oh! The row of the grid is also right up there as well. We've got a couple of riders down. Daniel Falson's actually hooked up with someone else's bike and has been able to extricate himself now. Hopefully there's no uh, red flag stoppage because there's a lot of bikes there off the field at turn one. There was a debris flag waving down towards turn one that time by Kawasaki on the outside. Going the long way. Not a great start for Oli Bayless. Drop back a few spots to start off with. 
have just been a fraction of nerves for Ollie starting on the front row of the grid, but no surprise to see Troy Herfoss and Glenn Allerton, both of the multiple champions in the Australian Super One Championship, sitting in second and third position. And this is exactly where Troy Herfoss wanted to be, right on Wayne Maxwell's tail. They'll have a two bike, they'll have a two man war for the rest of this race. The big question is can Glenn Allerton go with them and make it a three way battle? These two have been at each other all season long. They swapped the wins at the last round at Wakefield. The Boost Mobile KTEC Ducati stretching its legs down this front straight. This is what 300 kilometres per hour looks like on two wheels. Yeah, but look at Troy Herfoss close up on the brakes. He is a demon on the brakes. Having a look at the data of the team, Troy Herfoss goes from 100% throttle to 100% on the brakes in less than 0.1 of a second at the end of the start finish straight. That is cool. That is commitment. Allerton running inside. The top three, Repco Curve Cam, what a shot. I think Brian Starring just relocated the Repco Curve Cam. <laughs> Swiping their knee across it at turns two and three. Holly Bale's doing a great job here to hang on to the back of Glenn Allerton. And also a great start from Arthur Cece, but he's been able to hold the pace over the first couple of laps. Replay here of the start, you can see Holly Bale's didn't get the best of jumps, but both Glenn Allerton and Troy Herfoss launched their machines off the line extremely well. And no surprise to see Arthur on board bike number 61 get a cracking start. What a shame for Daniel Fowles. And so watch the 25 right in the middle. You can see the yellow fairings. And he was minding his own business down here at turn one. And it's Corey yeah, Turner. Corey Turner, yeah, got tangled up with Daniel. And then a few riders having to go off the uh, off the track. I think that may have been Aiden, Aiden Wagner that was uh, way out there that's rejoined at the back of the field. And Corey Turner has got a long way to try and recover his mo motorcycle. Now, he's usually a sidecar rider. He's actually the reigning sidecar champion. There's something a little bit free will action about that as the two guys got hooked up down there at turn one. Maxwell just settling into this race, circulating around in the uh, below 106s. I spoke to the guys from Pirelli. They reckon high 105s, low 106s will be the race pace and that they're not worried at all about what the tyres can do. The Michelin guys also think that their tyres up to it and the Dunlop, well, they know that their tyre runs well in hot conditions and that they should be strong at the back end of the race. Well above 40 degrees track temp. Fastest man on track so far, though, is Troy Herfoss with a 106.0558. So Herfoss right in the position that he knew he wanted to be at the end of the first couple of laps. Coming round to complete lap three. And Ollie Bale is still doing a good job there to hang on to the back of Glenn Allerton. Of course, Glenn Allerton, as we mentioned in the qualifying session, Chad, is on the brand new M1000RR. That bike before this weekend had run 100 Ks. The dealership ran it in for them. They brought it here. They put the race fairings and everything on it. Get it, got it set up as a race bike. And uh, their first experience was it, with it was in practice one yesterday morning. Impressive that it should be sitting third on the road right now. Maxwell's really quick through this sector. And of course, Wayne Maxwell is on a privateer entry. The bike's uh, built by Craig McMartin in his garage in Belrose in Sydney. And uh, of course, Adrian Monty, the crew chief, not here this weekend. He's actually re operating remotely from Melbourne in, uh, in Victoria. Got the computer link up happening. Getting the, uh, the bike set up, being, making the changes and looking at the data over the computer all weekend. Doing a great job to uh, make the bike more comfortable for Wayne. In actual fact, the, uh, the Boost Mobile with KTEC team actually assisted the Sports Ducati team by helping them uh, with the relocation of their timing transponder because theirs was overheating and the, uh, the boost mobile racing with KTEC 1 wasn't. It's a familiar sight at the front as Wayne Maxwell leads us to a 105.8 and that is a brand new lap record here at Hidden Valley. We're seeing that at just about every single track we go to and that is a big move under, under brakes by Josh Waters to get the move done down at turn one. So lap record speed here, race one, round four of the Superbikes. It's Ducati, leads Honda, and another Ducati in third. The front two clearing out, as we have seen the last two events of the season so far. Maxwell and Herfoss, Herfoss and Maxwell. This is the rivalry to watch in the Australian Superbike Championship in 2021. 11 points separate them in the championship. 
and a tenth of a second separates them on the road. And also, too, five points separates the uh, points for first and second as well. So even if Troy Herpos was able to win two races here this weekend, he would still be behind Wayne Maxwell by one point. That's, of course, if Wayne can finish in second position. This man here would like to have something to say about that. Glenn Allison, unfortunately, he's about 3.2 seconds behind the lead two now. And Oli Bayless looks like he's gathered his composure back and starting to pull away from Josh Waters on board bike number 21. Ripping pace at the front of the field. Three riders have gone into the 105s. That old lap record that has stood here. 105.9 from Troy Herfoss. Three riders under that record right now, including Troy himself, who's reset the bar to 105.6. Has been a good start to the first race. And there will be an investigation as to what happened down there. Turn one, lap one. Herfoss back on the back of the Ducati. We had this move down at turn one. This is Arthur Cece's in the 61. Brian starring the West Aussie on the South Aussie. Committing hard on the front brake. Just resting that Kawasaki to the inside of that Yamaha. Got the job done. And that was for a spot inside the top five. Brian moves up to fourth. Yeah, we've seen Wayne Maxwell's pace all weekend. It's been clearly on display in every single session. But as I pointed out to you in qualifying earlier this morning, Troy Herfoss has been circulating around, possibly a little bit under the radar. And a lot of people have been talking about the top speeds of the Ducati, but not worried so much about the speed of the Penrod Honda. What Troy Herfoss is showing now is that he's more of a, a racer than a qualifier. And he's out there, he's glued to the back of his great rival, Wayne Maxwell. You've seen how close they've been racing this year, and you see the amount of mutual respect between the two of them. That's why I think this race is going to go right down to the wire and I'm not at a position in this race at the moment to be able to predict who's going to come out on top. Yeah, Troy Herfoss really stalked Wayne Maxwell over the last few laps at race two at Wakefield Park before making that move really late to get the win. 86 thousandths of a second he won that last race by at Wakefield Park. So hopefully we're going to see something similar here today with that big long run to the finish line strike. Arthur Cici tries to reel in Brian Starry. So Arthur's doing a great job here to stay with Brian after he went past at the end of the main straight into turn one with that big move on the brakes. Of course, Arthur is a full privateer outfit, uh, the Unitech racing team from South Australia. He's got a lot of South Australian sponsors on board as well, which is great to see the local people getting behind Arthur. And he's been such a great addition to the Australian Championship as well, Chad. It's really good to have Arthur in here, especially with the pedigree that he's got overseas. And he's also got a lot of other people that would follow him from his MotoGP days that are now interested in ASBK. It's actually his sister who taught him how to ride in the beginning. Then he moved up through the junior ranks in Speedway. And uh, unbeknowingly to his parents, he actually signed up for the uh, Red Bull Juniors to run road racing for the very first time. Turns out he was actually pretty decent at it. Browner. And just while uh, we are enjoying this race, I do want to give a very quick shout out to Joel Kelso. He actually is from the Northern Territory and this weekend he is debuting in the Moto3 class. He came through the Australian Superbike Championship Junior Categories, so all of Australia needs to get behind Joel Kelso this weekend in Moto3. Yeah, good shout, Rihanna. I believe it's a two-race deal to begin with for Joel to get him onto the grid in Moto3. He'll be starting this weekend at the Saxon Ring. What a great opportunity to show what he's made of. And in quite a good team too, Chad, which is even more important. Because if you go to MotoGP on a bike that's just going to be no good and you can't really show your wares, well, the CIP Green Power team that Joel's riding for is quite a good team and they've got some quality riders that have come through that team in the past and got on to bigger and better things. But look at this battle between Maxwell and Herfoss. This is exactly what we've come to expect in every single round this year. There is literally nothing between these two great warriors as they make their way down the straight. And we're getting close now to the 16-lap journey where tactics are really going to start to come into the play now. Is Troy Herfoss going to try and show his hand, go past Wayne? He's down the inside on the brakes, can't quite get there. That Honda is not slow. It's quick in a straight line. And the slipstream advantage here is about 0.3 of a second in the qualifying trim. So it shows that it does pay to be in the toe down the front straight. Had a little bit of a look that time by. Not so much lead swapping going on, but this has been a theme throughout the course of the year. Troy has been happy to just wait and watch Wayne. The drama is we're past that three-quarter mark of the race, so if we were to get a red flag like we had at Wakefield Park, they would go back a lap. He waited a little bit too long to make the move at Wakefield. Sissy's fighting away here with Bayless. 
Yeah, Ollie making his way forward after uh, running off track at turn one, doing a great job to get back ahead of Arthur Cece's. And Arthur's just dropped back a little bit off the back of Brian Starring's machine. Brian Starring sitting currently in fourth place, just off the podium. The, the last podium position is still being held down by Glenn Allerton on the BMW M1000RR. What a sensational debut for the next-gen Maxima team to uh, bring a brand new bike here to Hidden Valley and get it on the podium if Glenn can maintain his position in this first race. Three to go. Yeah, the S1000R could only manage fourth in the opening two rounds so far this year. So a podium on debut for the new bike bodes well. Jed Medger, one of the biggest movers of the race so far, up five spots inside the top ten. There is Ant West. Cool to see Westy back on a motorcycle after a two-year layaway and had such a big career running overseas. Plenty of chances in MotoGP as well. That we'll have two Aussies back on the grid in MotoGP again, just like it was when we had uh, Ant West riding out there with the likes of Casey Stoner. This is going to be an interesting battle towards the end of this race, too, because we've got the two different tyre companies. Wayne Maxwell on bike number one has got Pirelli tyres that shot on that Ducati. Troy Herfos on bike number 17 has got Michelin tyres on board. The only thing that these two bikes have got in common is their KTX suspension and the fact that they've got two legends of the sport uh, behind the handlebars of each motorcycle. Pirelli tyres on the Ducati, Michelin tyres on the Honda. A little bit of traffic as well. This has been a feature of the last couple of rounds. Yeah, I think they're, they're coming up towards Michael Edwards, one of the most experienced campaigners in the field. He'll make sure he gets out of the way and doesn't take part in this battle. Actually, no, it's, uh, it's Jack Davis, the young South Australian, who's done a sensational job there to get out of the way and not uh, encroach the speed of these guys at all as they come up towards this uh, right hand here. This is where the real technical part of the circuit starts and possibly an overtaking position for Troy Herfoss as he gets good drive up that straight there. This is another place where Troy Herfoss might just shove it down the inside. We know he is a demon in the late breaking uh, block pass manoeuvres, as we've seen at Wakefield Park. He wouldn't be scared to do it there either, and then try and get the run. Upset Wayne Maxwell's uh, rhythm on the last lap either. You can see him using all of the track and then some. How cool is that shot? As the rear of that bike wobbles around. I'm watching Garth Tander nod in approval in the commentary box, giggling away, loving the action. It's turning some heads today as it heads towards the last lap. Race one, round four. Maxwell and Herfoss, and that gap has extended slightly to three tenths. Yeah, I think Maxwell has just lit the, uh, the afterburners now and he's going to put everything into this last lap because he knows that Troy Herfoss, if he can get close enough, won't be scared to try and shove it up the inside. Or oh, Maxwell just got on the gas a little bit early. You can see the back end starting to move around there. The lap times have not deviated out of the 105s pretty much for the entire race, Chad. So the prediction from the tyre guys is pretty much spot on that it will be high 105s, low 106s for the entire race. Only a few corners to go now for these guys and it is still Maxwell at leads. Herfoss not close enough to put an outbreaking manoeuvre on at the hairpin. They've run this race at a furious speed. Maxwell and Herfoss, they have been the top two guys all season long in the four races that we've had. Maxwell has finished inside the top two in all four races. Last few corners. Here goes the Honda, and he jams it down the inside. They go side by side through the last corners. He got him. Great move, Herfoss. Caught Maxwell napping, and can he finish the job? Last corner. Watch for the power of the Ducati. The run to the chequered flag. What a move. Absolutely smashed it down the inside, and he picks his pocket to win the race. Honda get the job done. Honda and Herfoss on top in the top end. And what a race that was. Allerton home for third, brand new bike, great result. And these two continue their rivalry. The respect is there. Incredible ride. Yeah, that was a well, that was a tactical masterclass from Troy Herfoss there. He stayed with Wayne for the entire race, didn't show his cards too early, and then put a typical Troy Herfoss move on late on the brakes. Managed to get in there so late that no normal human would be able to get the bike stopped and turned, but Troy Herfoss did. Look at this, just managed to turn the bike in. We know how good the Honda turns. Wayne Maxwell stayed on the outside trying to get the run, and Herfoss then had the right lines through the next corner. I thought that Wayne may have been able to get a good run out of the last corner and challenge him closer to the line, but it was all about Herfoss. He got the drive, he got the bike stood up onto the fat part of the tyre and he just got to the line in time. Six hundredths of a second at the stripe and they put nine seconds on the field as they just went at it for 16 laps. Herfoss wins this one, closes the championship picture to just six points with two races to go this week. What a show. Penrite Honda on top. Boost Mobile, K-Tech, Ducati, second today, BMW third. Ollie, nice recovery, got some points back.
and got it up inside the top five. Crew Halliday had some moves to make. He rounds out the top ten on his Yamaha. Matt Wilders, another good ride there as well. Lachlan Epes outside the top ten today. And Corey Turner, awkward start there, wasn't it, Phil, between those guys? And sadly, we didn't get to see Mike Jones. Phil, I can't wait to see what Mike Jones can do tomorrow. The podium for race one of round four of the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship, taking out third place on the podium for the first time in 2021 on the Maxima BMW. Glenn Allerton, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. It's a um, great achievement for the race team um, to pick this new BMW M1000RR up on Thursday and build it up into a bike that gets on the podium. Just shows how good the bike is. Um, yeah, it wasn't without its dramas. You know, I feel like I got really lucky then that Ollie ran off the track. Um, but I had my own problems too, so I'll take third place. Um, and I'm really confident for that next race because, uh, yeah, we had some really good speed then and just a little issue with the clutch there started to hold me back after about four laps. So, yeah, I'm excited. Congratulations, Glenn. Fantastic to see you on the podium this year, taking out second place in the Boost Motec with K Tech Suspension. Uh, congratulations, Wayne Maxwell Main, once again. An absolute clinic for you and Troy. Just got you on that last lap. Yeah, look, um, uh, we knew we were in trouble. Like, bringing these bikes here without regulation, uh, they don't like the temperature, and the, after about eight laps, the thing's flashing uh, temperature, high temperature oil, high temperature oil. So, we got in the draft, it was just going to be not. Good, so I just try to stay in the front, and then um, I know what Troy's like. He's such a great rider, such a great competitor, and um, yeah, I would have been surprised if he didn't have a lunge. I try to hang tough on the outside, which sort of ruined me for the last corner a bit. But uh, it was a really good race. Massive hats off to my crew, Boost, uh, everyone from there. You know, for early the tyre, look how consistent it was. It was so so good, and uh, we made steps forward. We'll just um, keep working away. So yeah. Congratulations, Wayne. Fantastic to see you on the podium, and taking out victory on the Penrite Honda, Troy Herfoss. We always know you love a late move and that one was something else. Congratulations. Yeah, well, at least I want to make sure he have to watch, I want to make sure he has to watch the footage to see what I'm doing. <laughs> it was awesome though. I mean, wait, did you know that you, were you biding a time seeing where he had his weaknesses? Yeah, yeah, I was biding my time. <laughs> is, that, is that what you were, that what you're going to say or is that the truth? Well, yeah, we've got two more races, but yeah, like I said before, like, I'm super disappointed in my qualifying, but like, you know, you've got to believe that when I say I can do the lap time, I can do the lap time, and that just showed that. Uh, what can you do? I mean, you, the gap, it's, it's pretty much stabilising because you guys are just taking wins of each other. What can you do to bring it down? Win more, I reckon. That'll be the best start. All right, we look forward to seeing what you can do tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Look at that for a day. Absolutely perfect. What would you expect? June in the top end. This is the best time of year to come up towards Darwin in the Northern Territory. And we've always looked forward to the different sorts of support categories. And so we thought, Garth Tander, that well, let's just send a few of these cars and bikes out there to race each other and see who's going to be quicker. We've done this a little bit before at Bathurst where it's a road car and a couple of variations of race cars on the circuit. But I don't think I've ever seen a super bike and a super car on the circuit at the very same time. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Something very different. Both competitive. They'll want to win it. So they'll be getting all the tyre temper up. They can. James Courtney, have you ever raced a super bike before? Uh, not from a car position or from a bike <laughs> position. So, no, it's... Uh, it's sort of as I left pit lane, it looked like a Scud missile following me, so <laughs> I'm quietly crapping myself. Nicely said, James. Okay, let's come over here to three times superbike champion, Wayne Maxwell. Wayne, it's been since 2013 that you guys have been here with us, racing on a supercars weekend. How pumped are you guys to be back? Oh, it's fantastic. The atmosphere and the reception from you know, all the drivers, all the teams, you know, all the officials, it's really good. And, um, you know, it's the best uh, motorsport category in Australia and it's great to be here. Absolutely. Do you think it'll be easy to make a queen, clean sweep of James Courtney over there? Oh, I don't know. He's been, uh, he's pretty eager. He wouldn't like losing. I'm sure you know James as well as I do. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a bit of fun and, uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's a uh, I think we haven't really get to see these opportunities much. So, yeah, we'll hopefully uh, get the jump and be able to hold him off. I'm so excited. Get on your bike there and we'll start this race very soon. Wayne, um, very, very experienced. Both these guys in their retrospective categories, very, very experienced. I actually used to train with Wayne Maxwell way back when, um, in the late 2000s, 2009, 10 and 11. We had the same trainer, used to do a lot of training together. Very fit guy. You have to be so fit to ride these super bikes. And uh, he goes all right on a push bike too, Wayne. Does a lot of push bike riding. Very, very fit guy. James Courtney, we know he does a lot of fitness, usually with his shirt off um, and on Instagram. So uh, very different ways about heat. Very, very hot in the cabin of a supercar. 
Uh, we talk about that often, but just think about superbike riders with their leathers on in these hot baking sun conditions. So expect to see that Ducati potentially win the race down towards turn one. Can Courtney really in over the rest of the lap? Both decorated drivers and riders in their careers, both former champions. The reigning superbike champion up against James Courtney in the Boost Mobile Mustang. Look at the Ducati go! That's traction control for you. Superbike Ducati has traction control. We know a supercar doesn't, so Waxwell out of the blocks is gone. Only thing that'll work against him here as well is you have to be really careful with that front tyre temperature. We saw on the grid that the Superbike team had the tyre blanket straight back on the bike. That tyre temperature so critical on a bike. Such a small contact patch of rubber. Think about the contact patch difference between these two vehicles. And look at JC now. He's got much more confidence in the front of the car. The second part of the lap, he's straight onto the tailpipe of Maxwell. Oh. Maxwell runs it wide. Opens the door, Courtney goes through. It's going to be very hard for Maxwell to get back around him through this last sector, but if he's patient, he'll know that he's got the horsepower under him and the power to weight ratio to potentially catch the Mustang on the way to the chequered flag. Final sector, last few corners. Can the Ducati reel in the Mustang? Look how hard Maxwell was pushing through that valley section coming out at the rear tail. Lids up sideways. The bike has traction control, but it enables a little bit of slip. Hard on the gas. Now, this is where the Superbike's got some real go. <laughs> Look at it go. Pulls out. They're going to be side by side at the finish line just. <laughs> Thumbs up across towards James Courtney. That was really cool. The last Superbike race at Wakefield Park was 86 thousandths of a second. I think that was even closer. That was really close. Really demonstrated the difference about how the two <laughs> vehicles achieved their lap time. Supercar much, much faster on the entry to the corner, but once the Superbike is able to get the power to the ground and load that rear tyre, G does it fire off the corner. Talking to the technicians back in the Superbike paddock last night, the numbers were somewhere around 300 to 305 kilometres per hour down this front straight. They are missiles. That's good when you compare that to a supercar, 265, 270 k an hour at the end of the straight. And think about the Superbike, it actually breaks earlier than the supercar at the end of the straight. We get a replay as the cars and the bike comes to the line. Oh. And there you go, it was half a bike length, not half a car length, half a bike length in it as they cross the line. Wayne Maxwell, that was so exciting. I thought you ran wide there, you were going to lose it, and there's nothing like the superbike horsepower at the end. Yeah, well, you normally like don't try to attack from the start, and then I went in there and I got on a little bit of marbles, and I was like, oh, I don't really want to crash. So, uh, yeah, I just overcooked it a bit, and then James came underneath. But the corner speed of the V8 supercar is like amazing. I was like, being on the track, you see it from the outside, being on the track, um, yeah, it's really good and a great bit of fun, and pretty close there at the end. Pretty close, that's for sure. JC, how was that? It was like having a missile coming at you down the straight. So, uh, no, it was ridiculous to start, you know, the power off the start line. But you can just really see the difference between the bike and the car. But, no, it was awesome. It was a good experience. You guys rocked it. Just gave me the best pumping start to the weekend. All the best. Thanks so much. Surname is Waters this weekend in Darwin. Three times Australian Superbike champion Josh Waters and cousin Cam Waters. Cam, now I've heard you actually have never offered or even taken Josh for a, for a hot lap. And now what's what's taking you so long to offer? Uh, just stars have never aligned. So uh, here we are, we're getting him in the car. There's no way I'm getting on the back of the bike. So um, this is going to be it. <laughs> Josh, now you have gone for a hot lap, but never with your cousin Cam. How much faith do you have in him around this circuit here in Darwin? Uh, I feel like I'm in very safe hands. Um, yeah, I, I reckon I'm going to love it, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, it'll be interesting to see the, the differences because I only rode, you know, an hour ago, so um, no, I'm looking forward to it. Enjoy, wish you all the best. Have a look at what he's doing with the steering yeah. wheel. You've got a roof above your head this yeah. time, so enjoy that. Ah, uh, sweet. I'm really looking forward to it.
have been a success? <laughs> it was, I, I was just saying to Cam, it's a lot busier than I thought. Um, I thought he'd forgotten to brake a few <laughs> times. And I was, he said before we went out, the tyres were pluggers and all that stuff. But yeah, a huge thrill and um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Now, just give us a bit of a sense of the differences you notice straight away between your bike and the car. Uh, probably the how good this thing stops and how fast he goes around the turns. Also, the, uh, the amount of circuit that he uses was a huge surprise. So, no, nah, it was um, definitely enjoyable. <laughs> any, any chance you're going to hop on the other side of the car at some point in your career? I don't know. I'll put the hard word on him. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll see yeah. what we can organise. Nah, awesome. So, yeah, nah, that was a yeah, really, really good experience. We're going to be setting them off very shortly for race number two. We've got Rihanna Crean keeping a coverage on everything that's going in this field right now. And there's been a little bit of news and some guys missing off the grid today, Rihanna. Yeah, thanks very much, Chad. There has been some news overnight and it's really disappointing for Desmo Sport Ducati's Mike Jones. We saw him have that really nasty crash in qualifying yesterday. He didn't take part in that first race. He was taken off-site to Royal Darwin Hospital. Now, the news from that is he had a really nasty break and dislocation to his toe. They reset that overnight. He's had some really serious damage done to his finger. He's uh, going to go undergo surgery this morning to fix that. So he misses all three races this morning. That is a huge dent in his championship fight. Really disappointing for Mark Jones. We are also missing Marcus Kyoto. He suffered an incident in uh, qualifying also and he wasn't cleared by the medical team to race today. Jack Davis is also missing from the grid as well. He uh, had some surgery a couple of weeks ago and just wasn't able to feel fully fit to compete in the race today. So three guys missing from the field. I just want to quickly jump over here and have a quick chat to Ant West on the motor go Yamaha because he was involved in that early lap incident but had quite a fast uh, bike in uh, th throughout the race and yeah yeah we're starting to get to get our heads around this Yamaha it's uh, and, and also me riding it I haven't had much time on the bike or much races so yes I was actually nervous lining up to the grid and I'm nervous again today which I'd never felt before like this much nervousness but uh race pace was good yesterday so hopefully we'll get a clean start and not like yesterday with uh, some ambitious moves from the other riders, but uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But I'm feeling confident after yesterday's race. Good luck, Ant. Chad, pretty interesting to hear Ant West is nervous on the grid. Yeah, that caught my attention as well, Rihanna. 40 years of age, he's been around this scene for a very long time. He's coming back off a, a couple of years outside of the sport, has raced just about everything he can on the world stage, all the way up to MotoGP, two-time winner in Moto2. Seventh on yesterday's race. His best season finish so far on his return. There's the one and only Honda in the field. Troy Herfoss, winner yesterday. Can he back it up today? Well, you'd, you'd have to say that he's a pretty good chance because so far the race wins in this season have been shared by Wayne Maxwell and Troy Herfoss. What, what Troy Herfoss did yesterday was he played a tactical masterclass. He didn't show Wayne Maxwell where his bike was fast. He managed to stick behind Wayne for the entire race and then make his move on the last lap and gave Wayne minimal chance to, uh, to come back. Maybe both of them might employ different tactics this morning. And I think also, too, there might be a couple of other riders in the race because a few of them have made some changes to their bike. Glenn Allerton actually rode most of the race yesterday with a slipping clutch on the brand-new M1000RR. It was only using fourth gear down the front straight chat. It was on the limiter at 15,500 RPM for the last third of the, uh, the start-finish straight. So that M1000RR, even though it was on the podium yesterday, will be faster today. Rihanna, looks like she's found a fellow West Aussie down there. Yeah, I have Brian Starring just getting some ice-cold water tipped down the back of his neck, but that's what we need here in Darwin. Brian, slowly creeping up the grid on this Kawasaki, the brand-new bike earlier in the year, and I think you were you must have been ha relatively happy with yesterday's uh, finishing spot. Yeah, look, I mean, as far as normal, you always want to be further up, but you've got to take uh, the progress when it's there. So yesterday was a step better. I'm hoping for another two step, like, uh, you know, two races today, better again. Let's see. We're trying hard. We're trying so hard. I know you are. Good luck, Ryan. He had that uh, full year in 2013 on the Grassini Team MotoGP bike as he throws the helmet on, getting ready to go once again. 2010 champion and fifth yesterday. His best result is Glenn Allerton. So first podium of the season for Glenn on this brand new M1000RR. Had a really nice time chatting to Glenn about this bike this morning. Have a go at this for a motorcycle. Those fairings alone, I won't tell you how much they're worth because it would make you shiver as much as some motorcycles are worth. But 
to put it this way, you don't want to drop them <laughs> because it's a gorgeous motorcycle. That little wing on the side, Chad, one of them is $800. Just Crazy. for the little wing there on the other uh, front of the fairing. But it is the brand new M1000RR. I think 20 of them brought into the country, all of them pre-sold. You can't rock on down to your local BMW dealer and, and purchase one because there's none left. And I, I asked when the next shipment might be coming. You're not that I've got a spare 50 grand to go spending on one of these things at the moment, but apparently the next shipment's March and they're also sold out. So what that means for these guys, it's actually very hard for them to get their hands on a spare bike because most of these guys roll out there with two motorcycles, one essentially premium bike and one spare. And for them, that's going to be very difficult to find some spares. Rihanna. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly uh, touch on Lachlan Eppes. What happened at the start of the yesterday's race, Lucky? Um, for whatever reason, I, I somehow managed to bump my bike into rain mode, uh, which means that you just get no power and absolutely no spin from the tyre, which is how you have to ride this track. And I just couldn't change it, so it cost me a lot of time. We'll leave it there. Thanks, Lachlan. Qualified real estate agent, youngest ever rider when he was 16 years of age to appear on the world super sports stage. And didn't he cop a ribbing off his dad about being able to change the bike on the fly? You know you can do that. There's buttons here. <laughs> a lot of uh, electronics on these motorcycles. Wayne Maxwell will start from pole position, joined on that front row by Ollie Bayless and Troy Herfoss. Yeah, it's a good superstar front row, that one. Glenn Allardson, third yesterday, first podium on that brand new bike. Daniel Fowlson has been really impressive. Unlucky not to make it through turn one yesterday. We heard from Brian Starring. He's outside row number two. Ant West, top of the Yamahas in race number one. Watch out for Josh Waters, cousin of Cameron. Been for a hot lap this week, and as we just saw, some Kawasaki's with some work to do alongside Crew Halliday. And a uh, three-spot grid penalty for Corey Turner as a result of what happened down at Turn 1. So, it's going to be 16 laps. Yesterday, we saw the tearaway riders of Maxwell and Herfoss go all the way to the chequered flag and build a healthy gap. Can bike number 32, that Esmo Sport Ducati, 17-year-old Ollie Bayless go with the lead riders in the early stages and keep the pace up? He made a mistake yesterday at Turn 1. Here we go with the Australian Superbike Championship at Hidden Valley. Race one was a cracker. What has race two got? Wow, was Maxwell creeping on the start then? Or did he just absolutely nail that start like yesterday? It was close. He'll lead the field down towards turn one. Regardless, CC's in that 61. Yamaha up to four. This is where there was drama yesterday. But nice start from Maxwell. But my instinct was telling me that bike was creeping slowly just before he released the clutch. Yeah, Ollie Bayless got a great start, so did Troy Herfoss, but no surprise to see Arthur CC's come through from uh, his grid position. Oh, got the run I think they are. Oh, that's it's Herfoss. Herfoss is down. Looks like a massive crash there. The air floods have been dislodged. I reckon we'll see a red flag here because uh, that bike is in a very precarious position. I saw a plume of dust go up from the Repco curb cam. And the Honda rider yesterday's winner is down. And this will have big championship repercussions. Red flag flies. That's Scotty Charlton and Paul Free from the Penrite Honda Racing Team there looking on with concern. Wayne Maxwell has a look over his shoulder, doesn't see number 17. It's a very narrow part of the track there too, Chad, where it comes up to that uh, right-hand hairpin. And it uh, looks like Troy Herfoss has gone off the track and come into contact with the air fence as the rest of the field makes their way round through now to take up their positions on the grid. Just to explain that, we're quite used to seeing tyre fences and tyre bundles in supercar racing. But with motorcycle racing, they do have inflatable air fences which get put out onto the circuit before the races in, in a case of two plus four like we have here this weekend where we do have cars and bikes on the one schedule. And just a couple of strategic places around the circuit where those fences and the, the hard walls are very close to the racing surface. So the line up on the grid once again. There will be a chance for the mechanics and crews to come out onto the grid. Seems to be ultra keen to get out there, get the tyre warmers back on because some of the tyres don't actually like a heat cycle, so they want to get those tyre warmers back on, try and keep as much heat into the tyres as they can and uh, get ready to go racing because we only have a limited number of tyres for the races here. All of the teams would have budgeted to have a new front tyre and a new rear tyre for all three races over the weekend. They would have already used one set yesterday. The second set would be on today. There will be one set in reserve for later on for this afternoon's 16-lap race as well. You, think you can see Troy uh, Bayless there on the grid holding the, uh, the umbrella for Ollie. And I wonder what happened on the start of that race as, as well between Maxwell. He's either getting awesome starts or it looked to be that bike was just creeping as he found the bite point on the clutch right at the start. So red flag flies here. So what's the procedure here, Phil? Uh, because it's so early in the race, it'll be a full race restart. They may take... Uh, a lap or two off, depending on the delay that's uh, been caused here. I reckon we'd probably see a, a, maybe a two, three lap reduction in the uh, the race distance. 
And uh, there's also a concern about how much fuel the guys will have on board to actually compete the race. If they have to do another warm-up lap and then a full lap race distance, a lot of them actually won't make the race distance with the, the fuel that's actually been in the tank. It's very precisely measured out, Chad. They know exactly how much fuel they need to do the race. Then a couple of drops more to make sure that they can get back to the pits. And they don't want to carry any extra weight that they don't have to. South Aussie, Arthur CC's on screen right now. Lives uh, in Virginia in South Australia. Fifth on two occasions so far this year. His best results. Interesting fact about Arthur. He doesn't actually have an Australian phone number. He's got an <laughs> English phone number. He's complained that he can't watch the coverage from yesterday on, uh, on KO or any uh, other uh, visible form of... Uh, of television because it's every time he tries to watch it on his phone, it thinks he's watching from the UK. You do realise that he could just uh, walk down to the store and maybe pick up a new one anytime. He probably needs to go and see Wayne Maxwell and get hooked up with a boost <laughs> mobile boost. plan. <laughs> maybe we're going to give uh, David Adderton a call to see if we could hook Arthur Cece's up with a brand new phone so he can watch the action on KO 7 Plus, however he likes, across the course of the weekend. So red flag here. The Brollies go back up on the grid. And difficult for riders in these scenarios to refocus after going through that whole start procedure. Well, this is where the experience of the riders like Wayne Maxwell, Glenn Allerton, and even Ant West to a certain extent will, uh, will really come to the fore because they've been here plenty of times before. They know exactly what to do. They can turn their mind back to going racing again as soon as the... Uh, the, as soon as the, uh, the officials give the nod to, uh, to go racing again, there's Daniel Falzon. He's a man that's won plenty of races here at Hidden Valley, but not on a superbike because uh, he's been here plenty of times in the smaller class. He's a multiple 600 champion in Australia, Daniel Falzon, but uh, has also won races in the Australian Superbike Championship as well. Started off the season a couple of years ago with three victories at Phillip Island. Just looking down at the grid now, there's Glenn Allison, as we mentioned uh, 40 years old, one of the most experienced riders in the championship, three times champion, uh, won one of those championships on a factory Honda, the other two on board Next Gen Motorsports BMW S1000 RRs, has been with that team for many, many years, has had a stint at the Yamaha Racing Team as well, but came back, as he called it, back home to the, uh, the Next Gen Motors Motorsports team and a long-time Maxima sponsorship as well with that team. So this is an amazing machine that they've only just introduced into Australia, and already here it is on the racetrack for the first time. And they did notice a huge difference in engine power, he and Lachlan Eppes, in between practising on the, the old S1000RR and this new M1000RR. And back at, uh, in Goulburn at Wakefield Park, you see those wings that are on the front of this motorcycle? They actually put that fairing on the S1000RR just to see if the aerodynamics made much of a difference. And talking to Glenn, he says that at 300 kilometres per hour, that adds 20 kilos of downforce to the front end. So that is uh, an amazing factor, how much these bikes can work with that aerodynamic force, and it helps to plant the front wheel when he dives on the brakes at turn one. So just getting some updates through from the crews down there uh, who are attending to Troy Herfos, and we can confirm that Troy is conscious, which is the news that we have at the moment, and this race has been declared, so it will not restart, unfortunately. There's Wayne Maxwell going over to speak to Dion Coote, the team manager of uh, Penrod Honda. Of course, Wayne Maxwell, Troy Herfos, fierce rivals on track, but uh, they have a, a massive amount of respect for each other as competitors, and they're also pretty good friends off the circuit as well. Yeah, it was a cool But once the devices go down, Chad, that's where it ends. Great shot of the two of them yesterday after the race finishes. As soon as the chequered flag flies, they're best mates again. And they were having a really good chat about yesterday's race. So just to clarify once again, Troy Herfoss is conscious following this lap one accident and the race has been declared. So it will not restart. And hopefully we'll get uh, a full race in later today when we return for race three this afternoon. And uh, our thoughts are with Troy right now, who has uh, clearly had a, a nasty one on that opening lap and everyone down there at the Honda, Penrite Honda team. Well, the race being declared means no points, so we were talking yesterday about the importance of this round. Uh, one of the big beneficiaries of this will be Mike Jones, who has now only lost a maximum of 50 points as opposed to the 75 that it would have been if it was a three-round three, uh, three round race. So, uh, unfortunately for Troy Herfoss, but some people will actually be beneficiaries of, uh, of the race being declared and no points being awarded. Daniel Falzen having a chat with Brian Starring. So... Our hard-working officials out there with the air fence. Yeah, congratulations to the Terra, who the Top End Road Racing Association, who have been charged, in charge of the air fence all weekend, doing a great job as, uh, as well. So great performance from them this weekend. Let's hope we see a great performance from Joel Kelso, the Northern Territorian, racing in uh, MotoGP at, uh, at Saxon Ring this evening. OK, now that we've been able to confirm that Troy is conscious, we are going to be able to show you a replay of what's happened here on lap one. 
And uh, great work by all our ambulance crews and our medical crews here. And the Australian Superbike Championship does take their full medical crew with them. So he was in third place, has a low slide and low side and loses that front end. And that is a fast part of the racetrack. And the bike reaches the air fence first. Oh, the danger there is the bike suffers big damages if that bike has moved the air fence. Uh, you can imagine Troy's gone in after it. So that bike yeah, looking, looking very extremely sad. Second, extremely yeah. second hand, but that's also, as you mentioned, a very fast part of the circuit, but it's only very early on in the race, so the tyres probably not 100% up to temperature, and Troy would have been pushing incredibly hard to try and make sure that he stayed in contact with those uh, fast-starting Ducatis of uh, both Ollie Bayliss and Wayne Maxwell. You can see there, just as he turns right for the, uh, the first time, the front end went out from underneath him as the rest of the field came through. And uh, unfortunately, Troy Herfoss out of the equation, but hopefully he's uh, not too badly injured. That goes to show you how hard these guys are pushing here this weekend. They have been pushing the limit in qualifying. They were down under supercar times, which is phenomenal, given that they are only really quicker in a straight line. So they have been exceptionally fast all weekend, and uh, we're sending all our love to the Penrite Honda crew and to Troy in the ambulance. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to hear from him uh, in the coming time. So we're going to pack these bikes up, sadly. We'll head them back out for race three later today. We need a quick break. And we'll be back with plenty more here from the Merlin Darwin Triple Crown. What an incredible weekend of motorsport in Darwin we have this weekend. The Australian Superbike Championship joins the Supercars Championship for the first time since 2013. And that means, Craig Lowndes, <laughs> you are dressed in leathers because you're about to jump on the back of this motorbike. How are you feeling? I'm actually OK. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm thinking it's more of a fact of uh, sort of knowing what we do in a race car, but what these guys do on a bike is quite special. How do you fare as a passenger? Never any good, but uh, <laughs> you won't be able to hear me once I get going. It'd be like me <laughs> taking a passenger. You can scream all you like. <laughs> Crew, how Today. You're the man at the front of the bike. Uh, how do you feel about having Craig Lowndes on the back of the bike? Now, I find that a problem. I think I'm more nervous about giving him a double than the two, three races we got on this weekend. So, you know, we've got to keep him in his commentary job. So, yep, here we go. OK, so what advice do you give to anybody on the back of the bike? Needless to say, Craig Lowndes. He's done a few things in his time. Hold on and lock your arms going into a corner. That's all I can say. All I can say is good luck, fellas. <laughs> Initial thoughts, initial reactions? Uh, quite interesting, to be honest. I think you, you know the lines around here, and and you sort of you sort of think about when he's going to turn in, but it turns in later, <laughs> and he sort of straightens up earlier. And it's sort of uh, I think the trust and the belief that the front end is going to be there when you tip it in. Uh, I was actually really impressed with the entry speed and the lean angle, and then the sort of the traction on the bike actually takes over the rest. Craig, tell me, I want to know that the best part about the the lap there. Uh, the wheelie out of the pit lane. I think that was quite good. It's, um, uh, it's just the impressiveness of, of uh, the feel they've got when, you know, even on the second lap into turn five, the rear just started to squirm a little bit and I thought, oh, OK, we're going a bit more now, but um, it's just really impressive about what they do and how they can rid the bike. You said to me you hadn't quite clocked, I think, 300 or just over 300. You have a chance to sort of suss anything out while you're doing on the front straight? Uh, no, I didn't. there's no speedo like a race car, so it's, uh, I have no idea, but it was quite impressive. And again, because we break a little bit later down into turn one than the bike does, so I was probably a little bit surprised when he pulled up. I, I thought we'd go a bit deeper, but, but like, he knows more than I do. <laughs> Doesn't take much to put a smile on Craig Lowndes' face, but I think the smile was extra large the other day. Crew's gearing up for this third and final race. Those two-seater bikes are really cool. They actually have a second set of handlebars off the tank for the Pitlin passenger to hold on to. Now, if you were across the coverage, across the course of the day, uh, unfortunately, there was a nasty crash in race two and it concerned one of our championship contenders. So we'll take you back and show you how it all unfurled. 
Phil Harlem series commentator joining me for their final race. Troy Herfoss has been fighting with Wayne Maxwell all season long and unfortunately came unstuck in race two. Yeah, he was desperate to try and stay with Wayne and Ollie Bayless as they both got cracking starts and through this first part of the circuit where it's very tight and tricky, Troy just lost the front end of the Penrite Honda. You can see there the first right-hander on the circuit that they come to, lost the front end, went sliding off and unfortunately the bike went spearing into the air fence which uh, pretty much dislodged the air fence and Troy followed it in afterwards. It was a nasty looking crash, Chad. Yeah, we all held our breath. You could see the state of that beautiful Honda as it bounced violently off the air fence. Now, the, uh, the good news was that Troy was conscious at the time and was stabilised and taken to the uh, medical centre here. From Crew Halliday's point of view, it all happened quite quickly as the field went on by. So the race was immediately red flagged. You could see he was in uh, an enormous amount of pain, which you can respect as he went into the back of the ambulance. So Rihanna Crane standing by down on the grid. Rihanna, what's the latest on Troy's condition? Yeah, thanks very much, Trad. Uh, Troy Herfoss, we can confirm he was conscious. He was talking to the race safe crew as he was taken to the medical centre here on site. He has since been transferred to Royal Darwin Hospital for further investigation. So just reiterating that he was conscious and talking to the race safe crew. So our thoughts certainly go out to Troy's wife, Emily, his dad, Mark, who was here watching the race. So we will uh, give you further updates as they come to hand. Just want to head over and uh, have a chat to Wayne Maxwell on the Boost Mobile KTEC suspension bike. Off pole position once again, Wayne. The conditions hot, much hotter than what we had earlier today. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely warming up. The, the, the winds just died down and it seems like the temperature makes it come up. So, um, yeah, it's going to be another tough race, I guess, this afternoon. But, yeah, we just got to do the same as we sort of did yesterday afternoon and uh, stay out of trouble and get maximum points. Is that what you're thinking about now, just maximising those points as much as you can? Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, well, I really can't stop thinking about Troy. I was just on the screen there and, um, yeah, so I need to get my head in the gear, think about the, the real task and, um, yeah. I really hope that he's OK. You know, obviously we're close rivals, but um, even closer friends. So, yeah, we'll see how it rolls. Really nice thoughts there. Thank you. Good Thank luck. Thank you. Cheers. So a vacant grid spot on the front row for where that Honda was going to be starting. Great respect shown between those two riders. Fierce rivals, but the admiration that they have for each other once the chequered flag comes out. We saw it at Wakefield Park. We saw it in race one yesterday. Yeah, we've been talking about it all weekend, Chad. They are great rivals, but they are great friends. It was interesting uh, talking to uh, Wayne Maxwell before and Crew Halliday. And uh, Wayne said, well, I might be having a beer with Troy this afternoon, Crew, so you're up. And uh, <laughs> I think that put just as much fear into uh, Crew Halliday as having to take Craig Lance for a double. <laughs> Got to roll with the big dogs here. As uh, Brian Starring, a thumbs up from the Kawasaki rider. Yeah, and one to keep your eye on in this race as well, because uh, Brian Starring has moved up onto the second row of the grid with uh, the elimination of Mike Jones and uh, grid positions being shuffled around for today. So if he gets a good launch on board that Kawasaki, they've been improving every race and improving every round. I know the team's been working extremely hard this weekend and Brian is fully pumped for a good result here. He's getting ready. Rihanna, I love these bikes. <laughs> I love them too, Chad. Uh, Ollie Bayless just having a pretty deep conversation there with your father, Troy Bayless. Ollie, you said that that first race was the worst start of your career. Second race, you got a pretty good one, but unfortunately didn't go ahead. What are you going to produce for this third one? Yeah, uh, hopefully hopefully I can go a bit better again because still the, the start in the second race definitely still wasn't that special. Um, we definitely know what we have to work on when we when we go testing next time. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, Troy had a had a pretty big crash. So I hope he's all good. Jonesy's on his way back from the hospital right now, so hopefully he'll be able to catch me for the end of the race. And yeah, I'm sure I'm sure race three will will, will produce the goods. Yeah, we very much look forward to it. And Troy Bayless, fantastic to see you here as well. You you yourself are recovering from a pretty nasty one. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming along slowly, but I'm great 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 to be here, and I think it's going to be a nice race, and Ollie's looking good, so. We'll see how we all go. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Chad, he's the most overqualified, un un overqualified umbrella holder we have on the grid. <laughs> <laughs> Three-time world champion umbrella holder. I was going to say the same thing. How amazing is that father-son combination? Now, Troy, his accident was on two wheels but without a motor. And uh, we heard him reference Jonesy. That's Ollie Bayless talking about Mike Jones, who came in this weekend third in the championship. So second in the championship on the way in, not in this race. Third on the championship on the way in this weekend, also not in this race. A reminder that Mike Jones hurt his hand in a qualifying crash yesterday. He's had surgery this morning on his way back to the track. If I can take one thing from all of this, Phil, bike riders are a different kind of tough. Yeah, and they also make sure that they have to wear the best protective clothing. And uh, you'll see the guys out there, they've got the best clothing on and uh, the best helmets and everything as well to make sure it's as safe as possible. Quickly back to Rihanna. Crew Halliday, I know this weekend's been pretty tough for you so far, but one race to go. 
yeah, it's, uh, it looks like the, it's turned on the heat for us, though. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I have been struggling. And, uh, you know, everyone has these weekends. I uh, just need to try minimise the points damage and, uh, you know, stay on my bike. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope Pro's OK for the first one. Good luck. Yeah, we're sitting pretty in the championship inside the top five on the way into this weekend. This is round four. They missed the opening round, sadly, uh, due to COVID reasons. That was meant to be at Phillip Island. The good news, they're going to get back to the island later in the year. There is not a better circuit in the country to ride a motorcycle than Phillip Island, but this one's pretty good too. Hidden Valley, their first round here since 2018. It used to be a regular feature back in the 90s, touring car racing and superbike racing together. But this is the first weekend that we've had the two combined since 2013. We saw the two categories racing together in Tasmania. Maxwell Bayless on the front row, Herfoss sadly not there. Allerton on the BMW. Daniel Falzen on return this weekend. First of the Kawasaki's is Brian Starring outside row two. Remember, three bikes in a row, unlike supercars that line up two by two. Ant West, first of the Yamahas. We're starting row number three. Arthur Cece's has made great starts so far this weekend. Josh Waters has won seven races here. He is the king of this track on two wheels. Great field of bikes. Corey Turner had to go back a few spots for that start earlier today after contact on lap one. Wayne Maxwell, reigning champion and championship leader with a huge opportunity to gap the field before the next round at Morgan Park. We are set. This is the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul. The red lights are on. Watch the Ducatis fly in the front row. A little wheelie from Bayless, but he's got his nose in front of Wayne Maxwell, and that is key. This 400 metre drag race down to the first corner. CeCe's to the inside of Allerton. The first of those Yamahas. The BMWs have made a fairly good start. They're going to run with the Ducatis at the front. Yeah, Lachlan Epp has got a great start on board bike number 83, the second of the uh, BMWs there. Sits down in fourth place, but Arthur Cece's no surprise to see him get a cracking start. Daniel Falzen right behind Arthur on the second of the Yamaha. So it's two Yamaha privateers that lead the way for the Yamaha's Brian Starring on a charge early, Chad. He's up one position and now sits right on the back of Lachlan Epp's BMW M1000RR. Some aggression from the West Aussie Kawasaki star. You can pick the Kawasaki's in their famous green. That's Josh the brand Waters, new. Josh Waters has got a cracking start as well. He's right behind uh, Brian Starring at the moment, so not too far away. You can sit him there trying to get past Daniel Falzon. Right behind him is Corey Turner, who's got a pretty good start from the back row of the grid on board bike number 52. He's fighting with Luke Johnston, second of the 17-year-old. So what a moment this is for teenage sensation Ollie Bayless. Factory Ducati leads. These bikes are faster in a straight line than a supercar. 305 clicks down this front straight. Yeah, just see Josh Waters there, got it all sideways coming down. He's leaving his brake into the absolute last minute. They're working on the front end of that bike, trying to give him confidence. The way he pushed it in there, it looks like Josh Waters' confidence is increasing on board that ZX-10 RR. And hopefully he can try and get onto the back of Daniel Falzon, who is setting a blistering lap time pace at the moment. Here Maxwell comes Maxwell. The inside. Big, big move on the brakes there from Wayne. But Ollie Bayless has done an incredible job early on to get away off the line. As he said, he hasn't had good starts so far, but they're to hold a very good pace over the first couple of laps. And look who's right there as well, the three times Australian champion, Glenn Allerton, on board that brand new M1000RR. His dad's a three-time world superbike champion. Talking about the rider on number 32, a Desmo Sport Ducati. And right now he is surrounded. Australian Superbike champions. Maxwell at the front, Allerton out the back. As they rip down this front straight, the Ducatis duke it out at 300 kilometres per hour. Yeah, Wayne Maxwell, you can see that his bike was just the same sort of pace as Ollie there. Ollie was able to slip in the slipstream, but wasn't able to get past on the brakes. Glenn Allerton's bike wasn't slow either. Arthur's just run a fraction wide there on board bike number 61. The South Australian still doing a great job to hold down fourth position, but he's under a fair amount of pressure from Lachlan Eppes and also Brian Starring as well and truly in the mix on board bike number 67. That's the BC Performance Kawasaki ZX-10 RR. 106-0. That first flying lap through. We were into the 105s yesterday. As we check out exactly how it started, we can confirm from race control that there have been no jump starts, so we're all clean to race. A little bunny hop. The electronics on these Ducatis helping to keep that front wheel down. The wheelie control, as it's called, doing a great job. They have traction control to help them get out of the corners as well. That was a pretty good start from Corey Turner. I was just watching it as they came down towards turn one. He went from the back row of the grid up to about uh, probably 
oh, maybe 16th position or so, so he gained a f quite a fair few positions on the run down in towards turn one. And uh, obviously, no surprise to see Arthur Cece, who've been talking about him all weekend, how fast he is off the start on board bike number 61, the Unitech Racing Yamaha YZFR1. Of course, it's got to be highlighted too, the fact that both Arthur and Daniel Falzon are privateer runners on board the Yamahas, as opposed to the factory machines of both Aidan Wagner and True Halliday. That was the swap of the lead. Maxwell up the inside of Bayless. Victorian sneaking by underneath the Queenslander. Originally from New South Wales, Wayne Maxwell. Wollongong born, resides down in Melbourne these days. And a privateer entry puts that whole gig together. As we go on board with Crew Halliday, tough weekend for the Yamahas. We've got Arthur Cece's up in fourth at the moment. That's the highest we've seen the Yamaha all weekend. I think Crew summed it up perfectly, though, when his job this weekend is just to get out there and get as many points as he can. Every now and then you do have an off weekend. What you've got to do is minimise the damage, take away as many points as you possibly can, and this is a 16-lap race. You can't win it in the first couple of laps, but if you do something silly, you can certainly lose it. Just a reminder, you can see Troy Herfoss name on the timing totem on the left-hand side, but he's not currently in this race, sadly, after crashing out of the opening race this morning. So two separate teams scrapping it out. Experience leading the way, but youth is putting up a fight today. The Superbike's turning it. Oh, big one in the background as well. Big one down at turn one. It's a Kawasaki. Yep, that's Matty Walters on board the Rover Coaches Connection machine. has gone down. Just trying to see where that was. I think that might have been up at turn five. And Corey Turner as well. Looks like he's off the circuit as well. So that maybe that's turn one. Looks like it's turn one on the on the exit there of turn one where that they may have come together. That's the fastest point on the racetrack. So Maxwell still leads from Ollie oh, Bayless. We've gone red flag. That red flag stoppage. And uh, after only four laps, I dare say that, that race will probably be declared. We'll see another no points uh, declaration here, Chad. Yeah, that's a tough one. Four laps in the books. And all respect to Ollie Bayless. He was really running with Wayne Maxwell then. And on that lap, was just about to set the quickest lap of the race. He was 43.8 in the second sector and about to dive into the 105s. We're into the 105 sixes yesterday, the lap record. Now we're getting down to lap record speed just then. But that is a very fast part of the racetrack to have an issue at the end of this front straight. Well, the riders are heading back to the grid, so hopefully if they can clean up that issue at turn one, we may be able to uh, get away for a uh, reduced lap race. Look, Johnson now, I don't know whether he's suffering from the heat or he was thinking that he was on uh, pretty good pace and he's disappointed that the race has been red flagged as the crews make their way out onto the circuit to get the tyre warmers on and, of course, get the riders under some shade as well. The big difference between what we've seen here and what happened early today, at least, is that uh, it didn't involve the air fence and Matt Walters is sitting up, which is a great sign. So with a bit of luck, we might be able to get a restart here. Yep, Matt Walters handing over his helmet there. As you can see, them come down the straight here. So remember, 300 k's on approach. Whoa. And this is going really deep. Oh, my goodness. Off the kerb, hits the other side of the kerb, and that's clearly some level of failure, whether it be brake or throttle. But that is incredibly frightening. Well over 300 clicks on the approach to that happening. And, oh, he has done an incredible job to avoid those guys as best as he could. Yep, the good news is that Matt is, uh, is up and looking like he's A-OK. -okay. Well, that is as scary as it gets. So what's happened to the Kawasaki? No, straight away there's a problem. Yeah, it looks to me like there's been some sort of failure with the brakes because he looks like he's grabbed the brakes at the same time as the rider next to him, but just hasn't started to pull up and uh, has gone in there trying to avoid all the rest of the riders. He's done a pretty good job to avoid everyone apart from Corey Turner. But uh, that's a very second-hand looking Kawasaki ZX-10RR at the moment. Well, very happy to report that both those riders were able to sit up and slowly walk away from that one. Red flag conditions here at Hidden Valley. things flying around here at Hidden Valley today, whether it be motorised or organic. 
<laughs> getting set to go back to green flag conditions. My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship is presented by Motul. Their fourth stop on the calendar, race three. We've had two red flags today. And that's the guy they're chasing. Bruce Mobile, KTEC suspension, Ducati rider of Wayne Maxwell leading this championship. One or two riders just out of position as well. This is the uh, tricky part of doing a restart. Some guys may have gone back. That's Ant West, former GP rider, just finding the grid spot that he needs to be in. It's not the spot they started in. It's the spot they were in when the red flag was shown. It looks like we're just about set and ready. Ant needs to turn himself into the race mode once again. You've got to respect how wild these guys are. We started with 21. We've lost a few this weekend. No belts, no cage, no fear. This is Superbike Racing and we're green once again. The BMW is another nice start. Maxwell with his nose in front, but here comes the 17-year-old Oli Bayless. He's not close enough at turn one. Yeah, Arthur Cece's up into third place as well. Glenn Allerton in fourth. Starring looks like he's up to fifth place and holding good position as well. Josh Waters, his teammate, not too far behind. But Daniel falson has got another cracking start on board the Caterpillar Yamaha, bike number 25. <laughs> Turn five it is. Maxwell leads. So Lachlan Epis going the long way around at turn five. Arthur Cece's inside the top three spots. The Yamahas are playing the long game this weekend. Yeah, Arthur had loved up a lot to get on the podium for the first time. His best finish so far this year is fifth place. That was at the first round at Winton, but he's looking pretty strong here all weekend, not only in qualifying as well, but the way that he gets off the line and then is able to hang with the, uh, the race leaders with some serious pace over the, uh, the race distance. rolling off the throttle at about the 200 metre marker, which is earlier than we've seen the supercars. And that was a little bit of a wild moment up the road as well at West. Finding some room down there at turn one. Yeah, you could also see that uh, Jed Metzger was trying to find his way past as well. Ant West uh, got bettered on the straight there by Crew Halliday as they make their way up into the uh, Turn 5 area now. There goes Ant West. Oh, he's back, back on the brakes. Is whatever you can do on the straight. <laughs> I'll do around the corner, says Ant West, as they come up into the hairpin now. It's a very tricky corner for the bikes. Some of the bikes going back to first gear, Chad. Some of the bikes using second gear. So the drive out of here is a little bit different. What everyone agrees is this next right-hand corner is incredibly fast. Michael Edwards has been in this series since the 90s. He's on bike number 37. And that's the bike that we were just riding on board with through Halliday. The Yamaha operation looks so slick here in the pits. As the leaders come back on, and Oli Bayliss again pulls out to the side of Wayne Maxwell. Six to go. Ollie's bike is incredibly fast, as you can see, but you've also got to ride the bike round the back of the circuit as well. So doing a great job to keep up with Wayne Maxwell there as they come down into the, break, uh, the braking area at turn one. You can see Maxwell getting all of the power to the ground now, heading up through the back of the circuit. Very tight and twisty and tricky here with a bit of undulation. The bikes get very light as they go over that crest now and come down in towards turn five. But Bayless doing a great job to stick right onto the back of the very experienced mate, Wayne Maxwell. He's won three Australian championships. He's been the Australian Superbike champion twice, but he's also been the Australian endurance racing champion, which he won with his good mate Josh Brooks many, many years ago. And Josh Brooks has now gone on to win two British Superbike Championships as well. Won it last year on board a Ducati V4R, incidentally. He's got Moto2 experience, World Superbike experience. He's 38 years of age. And this is a farewell tour as well for Wayne Maxwell. Wayne Maxwell is probably going to be retiring at the end of the season. Baylor standing that bike up a little bit early that time. Straight line. That's what we spoke about the other day, Chad, that the riders actually usually veer across to the circuit because it's very hard to try and muscle the bike back on line when they're trying to accelerate. They just let the bike go where it needs to go for the first part of it, and then they can get the bike back on line once the front wheel comes back in contact with terra firma. Yeah, it's such a different line they take down the front straight compared to a supercar, which square off that last corner, drive along the pit wall. This is much more about the weight momentum. Yeah, the 
first part of the corner when you exit the corner is all about steering with your body and your feet because the front wheel nowhere near the ground you can't usually turn the bike when the front wheel's not on the tarmac and you can see the way that they move their bodies around the bike to try and make sure that they get the best drive out of the corners that they possible Aiden Wagner is really trying to find a way past Rockland Epps here on board the new M1000RR right behind him it looks like it's uh, Aiden Wagner and also uh, Ant West with Josh Waters not too far behind big loser out of this restart the Repco curb cam has been uh, unfortunately Arthur Cece's he was up inside the top five spots before the red flag the restart has not worked out well for Arthur yeah, I'd say that Arthur's run off the track somewhere because he's dropped all the way back now to 13th position. That's not indicative of his pace so far this weekend. What is indicative of uh, Ollie Bayless's pace is the fact that he's set up camp on the back of Wayne Maxwell's machine. This is also indicative of his pace. He just broke the lap record. 105.4 for Ollie Bayless. New race lap record here at Hidden Valley as they turn the speed up and he is taking that spot that Troy Herfos filled yesterday, putting the pressure on Wayne Maxwell. Well, I saw Ben Henry. He said Ollie's going to win this race this afternoon. He said if Ollie wins the race this afternoon, he will have earned it well and truly. And that's exactly the way it looks like it's playing out at the moment. Wayne Maxwell has really got his hands full with the young hard charger. No surprise to see Ollie Bayless going so quickly, but in only his third round of Australian Superbike Racing. That's uh, an incredible effort from Ollie Bayless and the whole Desmo Sport Ducati team that have got him to this level. But then again, with a name like Bayless, you'd expect nothing less. He was quick in the Supersport 300 feeder category. He was also quick on the Supersport machine as well. Was uh, the youngest ever rider to uh, take a victory in the Australian Supersport Championship. Can he back that up and become the youngest in Superbike today? Even to get his first podium would be a great result. They've put a fair distance on Glenn Allerton on that BMW. And the first of the Yamahas is fourth. That's Daniel Felsen, Brian starring Kawasaki in fifth. Three to go. Has Bayless got an answer for Maxwell today? I think Maxwell's starting to really apply the pressure now and see if uh, the young pup can go with him. And Ollie's doing a really good job, especially through that very tight and tricky section to stay with Wayne Maxwell. This is where Wayne Maxwell comes back down into second gear, and uh, sorry, first gear. Then he'll accelerate up to second, short shift to third, and then it's third gear all the way round through the long right hander and up to turn 10 where he goes back to second gear and then holds that all the way until they come onto the start finish straight. You can see Bayless's bike starting to really move around at the back now. It's probably not because the tyres are struggling, it's because Ollie's really keen to try and stay with Wayne and he's getting on the, the throttle very hard and very early and letting the electronics do a lot of the work to keep the bike in a straight line. Reduced race distance does mean you can go a little bit harder on the tyres earlier. Bayless in the toe. And here he goes to the inside. Carries that momentum. And at turn one on the penultimate lap, the 17-year-old goes through, but can he get it stopped? He does. New race leader once again is Ollie Bayless. Yeah, Wayne Maxwell's a cagey fox, though. He's going to sit behind now and see what he can do. If Ollie's going to pin his ears back, he's really going to have to go because Wayne will just sit there and he'll take a good observation, a good lap of observation to see what Ollie's doing, where he's fast, and then plan an assault for the last lap. Essentially exactly the same as what Troy Herfos did to Wayne Maxwell yesterday afternoon for uh, 16 or 15 and three-quarter laps. How's the commitment from this 17-year-old? At over 300 clicks, he sticks his body out to the inside. The feeling of the air and the wind hitting you in the chest at that speed must be sensational. And able to get that thing stopped. Great move. You could see that when Ollie went past, Wayne knew that he wasn't going to be able to get back past, so he just sort of pulled back a fraction. You could see him just slowly changing down the gears and uh, positioning himself to uh, set up camp now on uh, the back of Ollie Bayless's machine as Troy looks on. He's actually not too bad in, in the way of nervous fathers. I've seen a lot of ex-champions that are watching their sons race that are a lot more nervous than that. Robbie Phyllis immediately springs to mind. <laughs> Last lap for the 17-year-old from the Gold Coast. The Bayless name synonymous with superbike racing, not just in this country, but around the world. Has Maxwell got anything for him on this last lap? Well, we said if Ollie wins this race, he will have well and truly earned it. He's got to try and hold off a charging Wayne Maxwell as they come down now. They're halfway around this last lap, Jack. They're coming up to the hairpin now where Wayne Maxwell probably won't put us. He's not close enough to try and put on a manoeuvre. Will he wait to the corner where Troy Herfoss did it to him yesterday afternoon in race number one? From a championship point of view, Maxwell doesn't need to win this race. He's got a big haul of points sitting there in second. Will he make Bayless earn this one in the last sector? We're about to witness something very special here in the top end. 
son of three-time world superbike champion and a MotoGP winner with Ducati, and that name Bayless. The relationship with Ducati is about to go to another level again. Maxwell's going to chase him all the way to the line, but it's only Bayless. The teenager has done it, and he wins his first race in the Australian Superbike Championship. What scenes? Well, Ben Henry predicted it when we spoke to him this afternoon. He said, Ollie's going to win the race this afternoon. He's not only won the race, he's done it in fine style as well, under an incredible amount of pressure from the championship leader and reigning champion Wayne Maxwell on board the privateer machine. So it's factory Ducati, privateer Ducati, and then privateer BMW that round out the podium. Ducati V4R getting the job done with a 1-2, and it's the factory team. Their first win of the season for Desmo Sport Ducati. It's been the privateer entry of Wayne Maxwell flying the flag for the Italian brand. Italian bike on an Italian tyre with an Australian rider. And that is a win that will be heard over in Italy. Make no mistake about it. Oli Baylis is a star and it's a pleasure to have him racing here in Australia. Surely one day he's going to have a ticket over to Europe. I can't wait to watch him on the world stage, Phil, but what a special moment it was to be here today to watch Bayless win his first ASBK race. Yeah, and he got it from Wayne Maxwell by 0.171 of a second with Glenn Allerton rounding out the podium 6.9 seconds behind the race leaders. Brian Starring takes a fine fourth, Daniel Falzon in fifth, Aidan Wagner up to sixth, Ant West in seventh, Josh Waters in eighth, True Halliday ninth, and Jed Metcher rounds out the top ten. Championship scene. Wayne Maxwell has a fairly sizable lead now over the chasing pack. Lachlan Epes, unfortunately, not making it home towards the end of the race. The second BMW, he was inside the top five before the red flag, so issues for that M1000RR. I think that may have also been a case of Wayne Maxwell playing it smart. He knows he's playing the long game. He's looking at the championship, and um, Ollie Bayless was uh, desperate to try and win that race. Wayne didn't want to get involved in any shenanigans, and uh, Ollie well and truly earned that one. And time for the podium for race three of the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship for the Alpine Stars Superbikes taking out the third place on the podium from the next gen motorsports team. Glenn Allerton, congratulations. Two podiums in a weekend is a pretty solid result. Yeah, look, um, yeah, I should be happy, you know, but the racer in me wants more and uh, yeah, we made a little setting change and we still got problems with the clutch and it just wasn't enough, you know. The good thing is we're ahead of everybody else, but um, that gap to those front guys, we just need to fix all these little niggling issues and, yeah, we can go with them. But, um, yeah, today wasn't meant to be, and um, I'm really happy. Thanks to the team. I want to say, uh, you know, I hope Troy's feeling all right. He's, um, he's been hurt pretty bad, and that's nothing any of us want to see. I've been through it myself, so I hope you're feeling all right, Troy, and I hope you get better quick. Appreciate those words, Glenn. Enjoy this moment. Look forward to seeing you at Morgan Park. Taking out second place, on the podium and extending his championship lead on the Boost Mobile with KTEC suspension, Wayne Maxwell. Wayne, another fantastic ride, but you got pipped by the young one. Yeah, it's so, oh, how good is it? Like, you know, um, I've always said that that's, you know, I'll keep racing and now we're starting to see some young guys come through with it. Ollie's done a fantastic job in those guys, so hats off to them. Just hopefully it shows some of the other young guys just to, uh, it can be done, get on with it. Don't whinge about all the stuff that's insignificant because, uh, yeah, there's the proof in the pudding. And um, for my guys, unbelievable. Um, very trying couple of weeks, uh, you know. Um, it's been difficult, but uh, we're here. We've extended the championship lead by over a race now. Um, so to Craig, Greg, Julie, Dale, Adrian back in Melbourne, everyone that came along with this one, Carl, Brett Martin from Melbourne, his wife, um, from Brisbane and his wife, Gay, like, he's other people, like, yeah, it couldn't be done with all that. And our other partners, Pirelli, Boost, KTEC, all those guys, it couldn't, some of them couldn't be here, which is a shame, but, um, yeah, we're leading the championship and uh, in the box seat to keep it rolling. Congratulations, nice to see you on the podium again. And taking out victory, he's a rookie in this championship, the Desmo Sport Ducati, Oli Bayless. Congratulations, just awesome, awesome to take out a win here. Yeah, we're uh, we're really happy. We've worked so hard over the weekend, and uh, finally, finally this year we've something we've had something click, and uh, yeah, it's it's made us go to the pointy end. Did you expect to get a victory here this weekend? You're so early in your, your debut season and it's been a fairly interrupted weekend with a couple of stoppages, a couple of incidents and to be on the top step of the podium. I don't know. It's like I've seen it happening. From a practice, I had a lot of confidence and then after yesterday when I made that silly mistake in race one, I told Dad I know I can win and and uh, he kind of just said, yeah, look, I think, I think you'll be out there with the pointy boys and then... Funny enough, it happened. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy and the team done a really good job this weekend. You are such a close family. I can see your mum and your dad just behind us. Your dad, he, he was crying in pit lane there. That it means a lot to your family. He said he didn't want to, but he said he was going to. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Cheers. Enjoy this moment with your family. Congratulations, Ollie Bailiff. Cheers. Thanks, family.
What another incredible weekend of action from here at the top end in Darwin. Round four of the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship. What a huge congratulations to young star Ollie Bayless securing his first victory in the Alpine Stars Superbike class. Of course, our thoughts go out to Troy Herfoss and his family. We wish him all the best in his recovery. Our next event, round five, will bring you all the action from Morgan Park, August in the meantime, keep up to date with all the action on the ASBK website. We look forward to bringing you the action from Morgan Park in a few weeks' time. Bye for now.